fruitful day. Thank you. Good morning. Can you hear me? Well, thank you for making time to participate in our symposium on the role of private patronage in modern and contemporary Southeast Asian art today. My name is Lin Ke. My role at the Short Pompidou has been to develop the Southeast Asian collection in tandem with research and outreach. I join my co conveners in thanking uh, the BACC for hosting the event, the French Embassy for supporting it, and our distinguished speakers whose expert knowledge brings us together today. So, on November, 18 of November 2022, the Salt Only was first symposium dedicated to Southeast Asia, inaugurated a contractor undertaking to melt artworks and to nurture new audiences through sustained collaborations with Southeast Asia. The symposium supported by the Friends of the Salt Only and KD Collection foregrounded two themes. First was the artist's monograph as a means of developing the foundational grammar in writing rigorous narratives of art from Southeast Asia which was expanded into a series of webinars in 2023. Second was the role of private patronage and collection in canon making and histories of art. I argue in the opening remarks, given private patronage's growing influence in both academia and museums, it is pressing to examine how it impacts the canon and art history and to devise adequate tools and methods to do so efficaciously and mindfully. More than a year on today, Rusin Pakon University and Bihasek is a privilege to further inquiry into the import of private patronage in modern and contemporary Southeast Asian art with scholars dedicated to creating new knowledge. We ask, who are some of these patrons? What? motivates them, what have they done, and how so? How was their philanthropy? And how has it impacted modern and contemporary Southeast Asian art and its prominence at the national, regional, and international levels? How have their priorities and activities evolved over time from the 20th to the 21st century? And what of the role in the future? Lastly, how might a shift in focus to their roles Revise the ways in which we write critical histories of Southeast Asian art. We have more questions than answers in this nascent field. Through our speaker's pioneering work, I propose that we probe the unknown, identify the lacunae and unevenness in emerging scholarship, and formulate ever more cogent questions to steer future research. It is said that it is often through encounters with the other of another creed and a foreign land that we see ourselves with greater recipients. For this reason, but not only, we are most grateful to eminent sociologist Natalie Heinig for accepting our invitation to share insights from her seminal work in the context of Western art. Her remarkable scholarly contribution to the question of art and artists beyond the discipline of art history offers invaluable comparative perspectives for expanding and enriching the study of modern and contemporary Southeast Asian art ecologies and art histories. Without further ado, allow me to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Ayn. <laughs> Natalie Ayn is a sociologist at the Centre National de la Recherche Scientifique in Paris. In addition to numerous articles, she has published some 40 books translated into 15 languages on the status of artists and authors, such as La Gloire de Van Gogh, Du Pant à l'Artiste, Le Trip du Jeu de la Contemporain et Écrivain de l'Ide Artiste, L'Artification and Le Paradigme de l'Art Contemporain, as well as on identities and crises, such as État de Femme and Cirque de Lira d'Identité. The History of Sociology, La Sociologie de Norbert Elias, and Pourquoi Bon Dieu, for example, and values such as Des Valeurs and La Valeur des Personnes. She has also published several statements, including Le Wokisme, Sabatil, and Totalitarism. 
and three autobiographical stories in Histoire de France, Maison Perdue, and La Maison qui Soigne. She has lectured in various European countries, in North and South America, Asia, and Africa. Professor Arnie, please.
then corporate patronage, which is less personalized and has become very present since the beginning of the 20th century. So you may know all that, but I wanted to remind you of these differences. So now, what about the history of art financing? In Western culture, there have been very, several ways to finance art, and these different ways depend from, first, the genre of art, still life, sense of daily life, landscapes, can be bought as a finished product. Whereas portrait and history painting have to be commissioned. So there is a first difference based on the genre of art. Second uh, difference, the occupational regimes in the visual arts, that is, uh, first craftsmanship, then profession, and then vocation. I will develop on it, of course. And I fully describe these three different regimes in my book, Du Peintre à l'Artiste. So, let's start with art as craftsmanship. In the crafts world, from antiquity to renaissance, artisans or craftsmen were usually paid according to the size of the work or to their daily work, following standardized scales based on working time and the cost of materials. This system long continued to prevail in the state commission's market. With the emergence of an elite of court painters at the end of the Middle Ages, this system came to be gradually doubled by the criterion of the personal value of the painter or sculpture, attested by the recognition of amateurs, specialists and peers. Renown then became the overreading criterion but only for a few art lovers. An intermediary between these two modes of financing was the system of pensions paid to some of the prince's servants through an annual salary guaranteed by contract. It meant a payment for services based on relatively standardized scales that were indexed to the person of the artist. The idea was no longer to pay directly for the work, but for the talent, as was done for writers, musicians, or scientists, who occupied a higher position in social hierarchy. Thus, the criterion of the quality of the work was doubled by the criterion of the quality of the person, and the performed act was superseded by the power to perform. For a long time, Royal patronage was organized on the basis of a combination of the three modes of art financing, size of the work or time spent, renown, and service. Simple craftsmen received payments or even wages, which equate them with servants. Academy officers received salaries, and the elite of celebrities received pensions or various rates. Refugees. The latter mode of financing, pensions or gravities, was the most prestigious and it will be the one to survive best right up to the present day. The consequence is a long term rise in prices, as evidenced by the very high prices often achieved after the death of the masters. At the same time, another consequence was also a certain delegitimization of financial rewards, since artists often have to wait and be paid in prestige and renown rather than in money. Thus, the commonplace and impersonal pursuit of money tends to be dismissed in the art world in favor of the intangible benefits of the general interests of art. So now what about art as a profession and not anymore as a craft? The shift from craftsmanship to profession happened from the 16th to the, the 18th century, depending on the countries in Europe, earlier in, in Italy, then in France, and then in other countries. 
for various reasons, it went along with an increased importance of commissioning. A commission is necessary when the work requires an investment of time or materials that exceeds the artist's resources, as in the case of large-scale history painting, or when it is intrinsically linked to its virtual location, as in the case of frescoes and large-scale decorative compositions, or when it is linked to the person of its recipient, as in the case of portraits. Also a factor of stability and prosperity for artists, commission has a double disadvantage. The first disadvantage is to subject them to the demands and tastes of the commissioners who can impose a given subject, a size, a place, and the duration of the work. The second disadvantage is to restrict the circulation of the artworks, which are condemned to confinement in a space barely open to view, outside the market where they could find amateurs and acquire value. Commission was more prestigious for the artist than the mere buying of a painting or a sculpture in a craftsman's shop. But it was also more constraining for the artist, and thus remained an obstacle to the autonomization of artistic activities, that is, the capacity for the artist to orientate one's production according to one's personal drives and to specifically aesthetical states, states an autonomy that is much better obtained by patronage, which provides freedom and prestige together with material support. This is why, though prestigious, commission remained a break on the autonomy of production, the independence of the painter, the mobility of the works, and the development of a market. However, parallel to commissioning, the market in its modern form developed during the same period from, let's say, the 16th to 18th century. Direct purchase from the producer gradually gave way to indirect purchase through an intermediary. The latter may be either <clears throat> an amateur, using his knowledge to organize high-level transactions, or a merchant, specialized in trade but sometimes not in painting. In the 18th century, salesmen specialized in the art trade began to appear, a trend that would continue into the 19th century and widely spread during the 20th century until now. This modern mode of financing, following the general rules of trade, fostered, together with other parameters, fostered the development of a third conception of artistic activity, not anymore as a craft or as an inter intellectual profession, but as a vocation. <coughs> so what uh, for art as a vocation? As long as visual arts were a craftsmanship at the time of guilds or a profession at the time of academies, their commodification mainly relied on personal transactions, be them in the studio, in a shop, or through commissions. But since they pertain to what I call the vocational regime of art, things happen to change on several levels. After the craft regime and the professional regime, the vocational regime, which began to raise roughly from the second half of the 19th century, rests on the idea that a true artist should be driven by a vocation rather than by the mere need to earn his living, that originality or singularity should be a major criterion of artistic quality rather than the conformity to academic norms, and that artists constitute a new habit which partly replaces the former aristocracy. This is what I developed in my book, Lilith Artist. As for art market in a vocational regime, it became what it means for us nowadays 
specialized intermediaries dealing with the circulation of artworks, art workers, and with their evaluation, art critics. American sociologists Harrison and Cynthia White have accurately evidenced the develop development of the French art market in the second half of the 19th century, or rather, since an art market had always existed but in less specialized forms, rather the de development of the modern art market, what they called the Merkins Critics System, as opposed to the classical academic and neo-academic system. Thus, art financing kept on reflecting the three poles of definition of artistic activities in the visual arts, that of art as a craft, focused on a product, that of art as a profession, focused on a service, and that of art as a vocation, focused on flame, fame and even sometimes glory. The latter is the system in which we are still dealing with art. So now, what about the specificity of patronage, both public and private? Since antiquity, and particularly from the Renaissance onwards, patrons have been helping artists. At the time, this liberality was linked to the fact that the production of images was considered a luxury activity, both onerous in terms of the time required and the cost of materials, and prestigious for the honor of the works. Hence, in order to support the most prized artists, the need to provide them with income over and above direct sales or commissions. Parallel to private patronage, state patronage has existed, existed since the Renaissance, when the practice of large moral collections and direct aid to artists began. But this concerned only a very small elite of renowned painters and sculptors. In France, state-supported artists was progressively transformed into a more and more sophisticated and bureaucratized system of grants and public commissions, especially from the second half of the 20th century. So why do some artists need patrons? It happens when their work cannot find an immediate market outlet, for example with innovative works, or when it requires a too heavy investment for the artist's financial resources, for example, large size or expensive materials. But let's keep in mind that patronage tends to be reserved to already renowned artists, so that it has almost no influence on emerging or unrecognized artists, except regarding certain types of public patronage developed in France from the 1980s. It can also mean less autonomy for artists in order to meet the expectations of their patrons. Now, why do patrons need artists? Of course, one reason is the love for art and the wish to meet artists. But their motivations can also be interpreted according to some sociological and anthropological concepts. One is the concept of an outward sign of wealth. Patronage may be an elegant way to demonstrate the possession of a financial capital. Another concept is that of conspicuous consumption created by American sociologist Thornton Thornton Veblen at, at the end of the 19th century. Traveling abroad, spending time for non-creative activities, such as visiting exhibitions all around the world, may be a way to position oneself high on the hierarchy of prestige, as well as wearing expensive clothes or possessing luxurious houses or towers. The third and last anthropological concept is that of potlatch, analyzed by French anthropologist Marcel Mauss in the first half of the 20th century. In some primitive societies, 
Expensive gifts are used as an evidence of wealth so that each member of the interaction has to give more and more in order to outperform one's competitor, sometimes since still nothing is left. <coughs> Gift economy differs from lucrative economy in that it involves the capacity to give something without immediate com compensation. Such a deferred circulation of goods is the condition for the giver to acquire non-material rewards such as honor, prestige, renown, and trust. This is exactly the case with patronage, which is thus a typical example of gift economy. So what is the specificity of <coughs> patronage in contemporary art? In the history of Western art, private patronage has played an essential role in artistic life, but this role has very much varied, as we have seen, according to artistic genre, from history painting and portrait to minor genre, and according to the times and correlatively to the occupational status of art producers, as we have seen, from craftsmen to professional academicians, and finally to modern artists. We can also differentiate the forms and functions of patronage according to the three artistic paradigms that I have identified in my book Le Paradigme de l'art contemporain, the paradigm of contemporary art. That is the classical paradigm dominant from the Middle Ages to the 19th century the modern paradigm dominant in the first half of the 20th century, and the contemporary paradigm, which emerged in the 1950s and has become increasingly present in the art world of the last two generations. In the classical paradigm, what is expected of an artwork is that it implements the rules of figuration that are learned and transmitted from generations to generations, apprenticeship and academic courses. In the modern paradigm, what is expected is that an artwork expresses the interiority of the artist, his perception, sensations, or even mental state. Think, for example, of the impressions or on Van Gogh. Even at the price of transgressing the academic conventions regarding figuration. In the contemporary part paradigm, what is expected is that an artwork transgresses the boundary, be it an aesthetic boundary, such as the, the common sense definition of art, a moral boundary, such as sexual decency, religious faith, a material boundary, such as the walls of museums or galleries, as well as land art or, or installations, and so on. This is what I developed in my first book on contemporary art, Le Triple Jeu de la Contemporain, the tribal game of contemporary art. This is why contemporary art defines itself by its opposition to modern art, for example, by challenging the requirement for authenticity, much more than by its opposition to classical art, classical art which has become more or less irrelevant since modern art became the standard paradigm for the general public. In contemporary art, the need to transgress the implicit rules of modern art went together with the practice of huge formats, be it for installations or paintings. This implies high costs prior to the selling of the work, if it can be sold, hence the need to finance works in advance of their effective making. Also, contemporary art became strongly bound to luxury from the mid-1990s. It was not the case at all during the first generation of contemporary art, for reasons that I explained in Le Paradigme de la Contemporain that is, the rise of a new and rather young financial elite with a lot of money to spend, a taste for speculation, 
and the scarce knowledge of the history of art. Contemporary art also became strongly globalized, which expanded the sphere of prestige and conspicuous consumption. All this fostered the development of private patronage, which was almost absent during the first generation of contemporary art from the mid-1950s to the 1980s. The globalization of the art world implies that what is relevant for Western art also became relevant in other parts of the world, including Asia, even if there are, of course, some specificities. And this is why I hope that you could find some interest in my summary of the history of art financing in Western culture and the place of private patronage, patronage within it. I thank you for your, for your attention and I thank the organizers for inviting me. Thank you. Questions? Is it uh, there is a moment for questions or no? Thank you, Professor Heinrich, for the keynote lecture. Thank you, Professor Heinrich, for the keynote lecture. สวัสดีครับผมนายพาวิจารณาคุณเป็นนักศึกษาภาควิชาประวัติศาสตร์ศิลปะจากมหาวิทยาลัยศิลปากรจะทําหน้าที่เป็นผู้ดําเนินรายการในช่วงแรกครับวิทยากรท่านต่อไปคือคุณโลซีวีซึ่งจะมาบรรยายในหัวข้อศิลปะเพื่อชาติใหม่ศิลปินกับผู้ประทับศิลปะและกระบวนการศิลปะท้องถิ่นเมื่อแรกสร้างคุณโลซีวีดำรงตำแหน่งประธานบริหารสิงคโปร์ Chinese Cultural Center มาตั้งแต่เดือนเมษายนปี2018ท่านเป็นพันธรัฐที่ได้รับรางวัลและมีประสบการณ์ด้านการบริหารจัดการเคยดำรงตำแหน่งผู้อำนวยการฝ่ายพันธรัฐคลังสะสมผลงานในการศึกษาที่ National Gallery สิงคโปร์และมีส่วนร่วมในการวางแผนและวางนโยบายศึกษานโยบายศิลปะเชิงกลยุทธ์ในกระทรวงสาธารณสนเทศการศึกษาและศิลปะคุณโลซีวีเป็นชาวสิงคโปร์คนแรกที่ได้รับเลือกให้เข้าร่วมโครงการคลอร์ดีเดอร์ชิพโปรแกรมในปี2013ท่านเคยเป็นทนายความก่อนที่จะเปลี่ยนสายอาชีพมาสู่ภาคศิลปะและวัฒนธรรม Good morning my name is Pami t a m n a g u n I'm currently studying art history at Singapore University I will be a moderator for the morning session Next, I would like to invite Mr. l o s i v i to present the topic Art for a New Nation, Artists and Patrons in the Making of Singapore's First Local Art Movement. Mr. l o s i v i has been the Chief Executive Officer of the Singapore Chinese Cultural Center since April 2018. He is an award-winning curator with management experience. He was previously Director of Curatorial Collections and Education at the National Gallery Singapore. and involved in the strategic arts planning and policy in the former Ministry of Information, Communications and the Arts. CB is the first Singaporean to be selected as a fellow for the c l o r Leadership Program in 2013. He was a practicing lawyer prior to his transition into the art and cultural sector. Please, Mr. Lo CB. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank conference organizer for inviting me to take part in the conference uh, today and it's a great honor and a pleasure for me to be part of a group of peers and colleagues uh, in the field of Southeast Asian art history, uh, all of whom I have uh, long admired uh, through the years. Um, it is now generally accepted that Nanya Art is the first uh, local or localized art movement in Singapore. And in fact, much has been written about it um, in terms of what the Nanya artists have produced and the uh, meanings of their artworks. But we have to remember that art making really doesn't exist in isolation because, as we reminded by Mr. TK Sapapati, uh, the very conditions that allow art to come into being are themselves subjected to profound historical forces and shifts. So what are some of these historical forces and shifts? 
Therefore, it makes it very important for us to look at who were the other stakeholders in the arts ecosystem, for example, the art patrons. Looking at the patronage, um, looking at patronage in the pre-war colonial uh, Singapore, we know that of course in 1819 the British had established uh, a free port in Singapore and from then on the population increased by leaps and bounds rapidly due to the influx of um, traders and labourers encouraged by the British authorities. So from 1819 to 1921, the Chinese population in Singapore expanded and eventually formed the majority of the local residents. Uh, even to today, the Chinese form 75% of the local population. We know that in the 19th century in Singapore, there was already a, an early or nascent art market. Uh, this is evident if you look at the Chinese newspapers of the time, there were already advertisements uh, selling and uh, advertising the sale of Chinese paintings and calligraphy and even with price lists of uh, the artworks depending on the size or the fame of the artist. Not much is actually known about uh, who were the people who bought many of these uh, Chinese ink paintings and calligraphy but we do know of uh, some of them and one of them uh, is this very famous example known as Ku Xiong Wan who was a scholar and a poet and inherited great wealth from his father who was a rice merchant and in fact used much of the wealth to buy art, commission artists and poets. So here is an example of a piece of uh, ink painting that was uh, painted for Ku Xiao Wan's birthday in 1920s. Things changed uh, when we come into the early 20th century and the art scene really became a lot more active primarily because of the influx of more well-educated uh, Chinese who were fleeing from the turmoils in uh, 20th century China. Uh, we saw the early arrivals of more trained artists, people who had uh, gone to the art academies in Shanghai or Paris by Zhang Wuqi, uh, Chen Chongsui and Lin Pak Tai, many of whom eventually settled become the first generation artists in Singapore. There were of course other artists who merely travelled through Singapore, for example the famous artist Shui Pei Hong, who came to Singapore to have exhibitions and raise, try to raise money by selling his paintings in Singapore. Uh, many of these fundraising exhibitions were to raise funds for the war effort back in China and they were fairly successful because by then there were many wealthy uh, businessmen, Chinese businessmen in Singapore who supported these fundraising exhibitions by buying paintings. Um, although the paintings sold well, but in fact many of these collectors had no intentions of starting an art collection. Many of them uh, merely wanted to show support uh, for China, whom they still regarded as their homeland or ancestral, uh, uh, ancestral uh, home. And after the Second World War, the local art scene in fact became a lot more vibrant. Uh, there was a growing network of art teachers, students, exhibition venues, art societies, art promoters. The local art school, Nanyang Academy of Fine Arts, reopened uh, after the war ended. And there were so many exhibitions by the 1950s in Singapore that the local, the, the UK, uh, UK art historian who was based in Singapore then, Professor Michael Sullivan said, not even the most cynical would say that Singapore has no art of its own. It is interesting to note, uh, during this uh, early period in the 1950s, uh, there were in fact two very distinct groups of art collectors and patrons. The first were the, a few wealthy Chinese businessmen. Uh, they had grown uh, wealthy or accumulated their wealth through trade and they had a deep interest in Chinese culture. Uh, many of them were either born in China or were born in Singapore but had gone back to China for their studies. Uh, these included well-known individuals like Tan Si Chou, uh, Yu Ki Lim, Lo Chak Tiu. Many of them were Teochew businessmen. Um, and after 1949, especially when the Chinese Communist Party came to power with the establishment of the People's Republic of China, 
There was very little demand for artwork and antiquities in mainland China, uh, and hence uh, there was an opportunity for works to come out from China because there was a healthy demand outside of China, in particularly in places like Hong Kong and Singapore. So from the 50s and 70s, uh, these collectors in Singapore had the wonderful opportunity to buy high quality paintings and their collections rapidly expanded. So for example, uh, Mr. Tan Si Chuang that you see over there um, was very open to sharing his collection, be it in public exhibitions in Singapore or through inviting other artists, collectors, even members of the public to visit their homes uh, where their collection was on display. But it's important to realize that these Chinese collectors, their main interest was really in collecting works from the classical or early modern period. So for instance, uh, Mr. Tan Si Chou was very well known for his collection of uh, Ren Bo Nian or Xu Bei Hong paintings. And uh, this was not surprising because many of them still felt a strong sentiment towards China, whom they regarded as the motherland. This was in the late 40s, early 1950s. And although some of them did collect works by local Singapore artists, their main focus was really on the classical and the early modern period. And it was a very different group of collectors who were far more interested in collecting local artworks. These turned out to be Western educated individuals who held fairly influential positions in the colonial establishment in the 1950s. And must remember, the 1950s was a very interesting period for us in Southeast Asia, in particular Singapore. It was a period of decolonization. The war had just ended, and many felt that in Singapore and in Malaya, many felt that the British had lost their moral legitimacy to rule, and many started to argue for self-determination. Uh, but during this period, although the British were also keen uh, to be rid of uh, this very expensive task of maintaining their colonies, they were also quite anxious uh, that when the colonies came to regain their independence, that the British interests continued to be protected. In particular, they also saw the rise of the People's Republic of China in 1949 uh, with the coming to power of the Chinese Communist Party, and many people in Asia were looking to China as an example of a modern republic. Uh, so the British wanted to ensure that their colonies didn't turn to communism in order to gain independence. And for them, the British then came up with a plan known as the, what they called the Grand Design. And the Grand Design really uh, was about bringing together the British controlled territories of uh, Malaya, Sabah, Sarawak, uh, Brunei and Singapore to create a kind of a federation that they felt would be strong enough and stable enough to hold together and not uh, be lost uh, to communist insurgents. And during this period, uh, because there was this push towards Malayanization, there were then many calls in Singapore for a new Malayan culture uh, and identity to be formed, particularly to unite the multi-ethnic groups that were present in Singapore then. And for many of these commentators, they felt that a new Malayan art form should really be a fusion of different cultural styles. And then, as you can see, uh, Dr. Carl Alexander Gibson Hill, who was uh, uh, a British appointed curator of the Raffles Museum in Singapore at the time, and also the first president of the Singapore Art Society, he held that this distinctive style should actually be a marriage between Western and Eastern painting styles. And uh, there are many types of fusion works created in the 50s and 60s in Malaya. And Batik painting was one such example. Uh, in the 1950s, a Penang based Chinese artist known as Chuan Tian Ping was held uh, for pioneering this technique of using indigenous Batik painting techniques to create Western style modern artworks. And even though uh, this particular style or technique was initially rejected by many artists in Penang, subsequently Chuan Tian Ping found a ready audience in Malaya and in Singapore. Apart from the commentators or patrons, uh, the artists themselves also spoke of fusion. Many artists use words like fusion, uh, rongpun, bridging, gotong, or synthesis, heping, uh, talking about this bridging between the East and West. 
For example, uh, the first principal of the Nanyang Academy of Fine Arts, Mr. Lim Hak Tai, in the 1950s said that you know, he could teach a student to paint in the Eastern style, he could also teach him to paint in the Western style, but it's really up to him to experiment and develop his own style. And to him, he felt that in Malaya, the styles can mix. Yeah, so you can see on the slides, uh, Mr. Lim Hak Tai at work both in a Western easel painting as well as painting on the Chinese uh, paper. And in 55, uh, Lim Hak Tai also urged young artists to focus on aspects like fusion of cultures of different races or bridging of Eastern and Western art. And so you see on the slides uh, two examples, one of an oil painting by Mr. Lim Hak Tai and another an ink painting. So he was one of these artists who was familiar with both uh, art traditions and often urged his uh, students to consider merging both or blending both. And this was not surprising because uh, Lim Hak Tai was amongst the first generation of artists from China who was trained in both Western and Chinese art in China's art academies in the early 20th century. During this period in China, there was great debate about how art in China should be modernized uh, as the country was modernizing. And uh, one of the ways in which they sought to do this was by synthesizing what they understood to be Western and Chinese art. Uh, Western modern art, with its emphasis on subjectivity, was deemed to be very consistent uh, with the Chinese CAE principle of ink painting, which often emphasized personal expression over physical likeness. So many Chinese artists at the time, in fact, saw no contradiction between Western and Chinese art and often sought to integrate both. So as the artists were experimenting in this way, uh, there were a group of patrons that emerged in Singapore who appreciated what they were doing. Uh, and they had some common similarities. Amongst the four people who I'm going to talk about later, uh, you could see that they received Western education and therefore they were quite familiar with the notions of modern art. Secondly, they held influential positions in government then, uh, as well as in media, academia, as well as commerce. Um, all of them supported the idea of decolonization and believed that an independent Malaya should have its own distinctive identity. All of them championed this idea that the artwork that was most suited for a new Malaya would be one depicting local themes, that combine Chinese and Western styles, and all of them also supported the idea of setting up museums in Malaya so that the uh, generations of new citizens uh, that emerged would also have a chance to appreciate their own heritage. So in the next few slides, I'm going to talk about these four gentlemen uh, in some detail uh, before I go on to talk about how Nanyang Art uh, was championed as uh, Singapore's first global art movement. So first of all, with an individual like Malcolm McDonald. Uh, he was uh, Singapore's, he was a British uh, governor general from Malaya from the 40s, uh, in the late 40s, and then subsequently became the commissioner general for Southeast Asia from 48 to 55. So you can see he occupied quite, in fact, the highest position uh, in the colonial government then. Um, he also was a champion of this idea of the grand design, of forming a wider federation of the British controlled territories in Southeast Asia. Um, he was one of these uh, individuals who promoted racial equality and really developed very close personal ties with the local communities. You can see him uh, in one of the photos uh, having a kind of a very close moment with the local indigenous tribes from Sabah and Sarawak. And he also promoted the idea of a new Malaya, one that would transcend racial boundaries. And he often spoke about that the peoples of Malaya should progressively think of themselves less of their distinctions of race and more of their common heritage and character as peoples of Malaya. In terms of his personal interests, he was a keen collector of Chinese ceramics. He collected most of his ceramic pieces, uh, Chinese pieces when he was based in Singapore. He often visited and opened many art exhibitions in Singapore and made friends with many of the local artists. In fact, he visited a very well-known exhibition in 53, known as the Pictures of Bali exhibition, uh, three times and uh, bought artworks and even invited the four artists back to his residence for tea. Amongst the local collectors whom he admired, he 
really uh, looked up to Chong Su Ping the most and often bought works for himself as well as for others. He often urged uh, the public to buy works from living artists because he felt that uh, by supporting them, they could then be given funds uh, to continue with their art making. And he was again one of those who believed that art uh, was very important towards the building of national identity and eventually donated quite a large proportion of his own personal collection uh, to the University of Malaya Art Museum in the 50s and the 60s. The second individual I want to talk about is an Australian journalist, Frank Sullivan. And uh, he came to Southeast Asia in the late 40s and had occupied a number of important positions in media, including uh, the British uh, Far Eastern Broadcasting Service and more importantly um, at the Federation of Malaya's Public Relations Department and eventually was the press secretary to the first Prime Minister of Malaysia, Tunku Abdul Rahman. And in fact, in 57, he himself obtained Singapore citizenship. Uh, Frank Sullivan was important because he was extremely active in the Singapore art scene in the 50s, especially as Vice President of the Singapore Art Society, uh, which was then a very active society who, which maintained very good relationships with the British <laughs> colonial government and held many exhibitions at the British Council Hall. Um, the British government really supported the art society, Singapore Art Society because uh, they really wanted to uh, portray or convey this sense that uh, to, to win the hearts and minds of the Malayan uh, public uh, through supporting such cultural activities. And for them, they felt that the Singapore society, because it was a multiracial society, uh, was best suited uh, towards this Malayanization effort. Frank Sullivan strongly believed that uh, Malaya was really a meeting place for all the four races, Malay, Chinese, Indian and European, and could act as a bridge between the cultures of East and West. And amongst the local artists, he most admired again Chong Su Bing, uh, for he felt, he, he felt that Chong Su Bing uh, best exemplified this bridging of two worlds. Uh, Frank Sullivan, despite his very modest uh, government salary, was often buying paintings, especially from younger artists, for he felt that uh, there is no more important event in the life of any artist than the day that he sells his first painting. So for him, uh, Frank Sullivan wanted to often encourage young artists. And Frank also often wrote to the press, uh, often urging the public to buy local art, uh, including making newspaper appeals to help raise funds for needy artists in Singapore. Frank Sullivan was motivated to collect art because he noticed that in fact most of the early art collectors then in the 40s and 50s tended to be European expatriates and who after finishing their stint in Southeast Asia would bring their art collections back home with them. So many important artworks were then lost uh, to Singapore. So he started to buy his own artworks and he also uh, complemented the efforts of the local businessman Lok Wan Do who had booted the idea of setting up an art museum because Frank also believed it was important for there to be a national uh, type of a national museum where the peoples of Singapore could see their own culture on display. So by 1957, Frank Sullivan had acquired about 64 works. This was second in quantity to Lokwanto's collection of 80 works. And after Frank Sullivan left Singapore to become the press secretary to the Malaysian Prime Minister in KL, he continued to be very active in Malaysia, including helping to set up the National Art Gallery in 58, and also eventually setting up a commercial gallery in KL uh, from the 60s onwards. Then we go on to the third individual, uh, Lok Wan Do. Uh, many know him as a wealthy businessman who was uh, very involved in the film business, particularly leading the Cathay organization, which was a regional leader in Malay and Chinese films in the 50s and 60s. And in fact, his business empire included hotels, <laughs> Uh, cinema chains, film studios, and so on. Apart from his uh, acumen as a businessman, he was also trusted by the establishment and uh, was often asked to head boards of companies like Malayan Banking, uh, Singapore Telephone Board, as well as the uh, Pro-Chancellor of the University of Malaya, as well as the first chairman of the National Library Board. Lowanto himself was an award-winning photographer and also well-known for collecting art and antiquities and he was extremely supportive of the visual arts in Singapore 
and often uh, graced uh, many Singapore Art Society exhibitions. And as you can see from the quote here, again, he was uh, very much for the idea of uh, bringing the different races together and see the artworks as a way to express uh, racial diversity and unity in Singapore. And again, like Frank Sullivan, he often urged the public, be they the homeowners, local businessmen, or even the government departments to buy more local artworks to support local artists. So by the 50s, no, Wanto already had Singapore's largest art collection and had planned to build a museum to benefit the public. Uh, for various reasons, the, the museum didn't materialize, I think primarily because by 1958, the Malaysian government in Kuala Lumpur had already set up a national art gallery, and therefore, perhaps Lomanto felt that there was no need to replicate another national art gallery in Singapore. But in the 1960, he did donate a great part of his collection to the Singapore government, which was the Ministry of Culture, and this was subsequently augmented again in the 1960s and shortly after when he passed away in 63 and 64. Lomanto was again a big champion of Chong Su Ping, um, whom he greatly admired and was a guest of honour for his exhibitions. And he himself was known to have bought two to three paintings a month, not only for his own collection, but to give away to his friends and business partners. And in fact, helped to effect many uh, useful introductions to Chong Su Ping when Su Ping was in Europe, introducing him to galleries, uh, collectors, and other patrons uh, in Europe. And the last individual that I wanted to talk about was Michael Sullivan. Uh, he is a British art historian of Chinese painting, uh, but he in fact arrived in Singapore in '54 to teach art history. Uh, at the University of Malaya and uh, he was again one of these people who felt very strongly that uh, Malay, the Malayan artists were the ones who were at the forefront of creating Malayan culture and eventually Malayan art would be something of a synthesis of different cultures as you can see in this quote here it should combine something of the Malay genius for uh, decoration and craftsmanship the Indian understanding of the transcendental and the intuitive Chinese feeling for the vitality of the natural world as well as the European impulse to analyse and to experiment. So this was how he, he thought uh, the ideal Malayan art form should take. Uh, Michael Sullivan was also uh, critical because he had helped to set up the first uh, teaching museum at the University of Malaya in '56. Uh, so this was the first time that there was a, a museum devoted to art and culture in Singapore looking specifically at Southeast Asia. And in particular at the museum, he would also wanted to build up a visual arts collection in order to showcase the new national art that was slowly emerging in Malaya. And as a result, uh, during his time, the museum had also acquired works by Chong Su Ping, Chen Chong Sui, Lin Pak Tai and other Singapore artists. So this was the first time in Singapore's history that the modern works by local artists were acquired to an institutional museum for study and for public appreciation. Michael Sullivan himself was very friendly with many of our local artists and in fact considered Su Ping to be the most talented of all the Singapore artists of his generation and, um, and he even acquired quite a number of Chong Su Ping paintings for his own personal collection which were then eventually donated to the Ashmolean Museum at the University of Oxford. It's important to realise that as we speak about this new fusion Malayan art that was emerging in the 1950s, uh, there was a concurrent emergence of another type of artwork, and this is something that we call social realist art in Singapore. And these were produced by artists with kind of inclination for work, for commenting about social realities in Singapore and Malaya. Uh, they tended to be uh, by younger artists who were either born in Singapore or who had been born in China but you know, grew up in Singapore. And therefore, their life experiences were informed by what they saw in Singapore. They were taught by older artists, by Su, like Chong Su Ping, who championed fusion art. But for many of these younger artists, uh, it, they were not so interested in what their teachers were producing. Rather, they wanted to create an artwork, art, artworks that could effect social change, in particular, the independence of Singapore from the British. And so in many of their artworks, they were depicting the plight of the poor, the working classes, and showing the injustices of Singapore, uh, the injustices of colonialism. Because for many of them, they felt that this was a much more truthful way of representing Singapore, rather than the fusion artworks of their teachers. 
Although this is not to say that the older artists uh, did not produce uh, works that commented on social realities. There were, of course, older artists that did, but their works were often not so explicitly or emotionally charged. As you can see from the two examples here, uh, the works were often rendered more ambiguous by their conventions of Chinese using Chinese ink painting styles or modern uh, Western modern art styles like Cubism. Uh, so on the far left, uh, far right, you can see an oil painting by Lim Hak Tai talking about the student riots in the 1950s but rendered in a kind of cubist style. And on the left, you can see the ink painting by Chen Chong Sui uh, commenting about the confrontation period when uh, this was a particularly tumultuous period in the 1960s when Indonesia opposed uh, the formation of Malaysia. And uh, here you have Chen Chongsui talking about the confrontation, but it is Chinese inscription, so you have to understand Chinese before you can understand the context of this particular artwork. So by uh, employing these kind of artistic strategies, the older artists were in fact uh, able to kind of not attract the attention of the colonial authorities. So when we look at the colonial era patrons like uh, Lo Guan to or Frank Sullivan, uh, and quite many of them, none of them associated with uh, the social realist artists. Uh, this was understandable. The younger artists uh, were eager for decolonization and didn't really want to associate with the colonial elites. But for the colonial elites, for them, they really favored fusion art and wanted, uh, preferred a kind of an art form or an art works uh, that anticipated a future Malayan identity rather than one that depicted present-day uh, harsh realities. And this was very much aligned with the colonial authorities' desire to convince the peoples of Malaya uh, that the government of the day was able to maintain the stability and the security of the country. By the 1960s, many of these colonial era patrons had soon, would soon fade out of the scene. For example, Michael McDonald left Malaya in 55 to assume other official duties. Frank Sullivan left for Kuala Lumpur in '58 to become the press secretary, as I mentioned. Uh, Michael Sullivan, his tenure ended in the 1960, and then he left to teach in the UK. And Lobanto, unfortunately, uh, had an untimely demise due to a flight crash uh, in 1964 in Taiwan. But the efforts in promoting Malayan art or fusion art with this multicultural aesthetics were continued by others in the post-independence period. In '59, we know Singapore gained self-independence, uh, self-governing status, which eventually led to its independence by merging with Malaya. Um, and the new Singapore government of the day also promoted Malayan culture and consciousness. Uh, for them, they felt that this was a very effective way uh, to avoid communal rivalry and racial strife, so they sought as much as possible uh, to integrate the different uh, ethnic groups together. So for instance, our first culture minister, Mr. S. Rajaratnam, often urged the different ethnic groups to learn from each other uh, through a process of cross stimulation so that uh, eventually a national or common culture could emerge. And it's interesting to note that during this early period from 59 to 63, the self-governing period all the way to independence through merger, the new Singapore government was also fairly supportive of the social realist works that were being produced by the left-leaning uh, organisations in Singapore like the Equator Art Society. So the, in fact, the minister that I just mentioned also opened a number of art exhibitions by the Equator Art Society and uh, complemented uh, their efforts. So in fact, Mr. S. Rajaratnam liked this particular painting so much that the artist Chamiati gifted the painting uh, to the minister and the minister eventually hung the painting for many years at the city hall building. Uh, so there was really no um, inconsistency between the new government's stance uh, and what the social realist artists were trying to produce. But by the early 60s, uh, the social climate changed uh, by then, the government started to clamp down on left-wing activism uh, because many of the left-leaning politicians of the day, in fact, opposed uh, the plan to merge with Malaya for, to gain independence. 
Uh, and therefore, the colonial authorities then worked with the new government to clamp down on left-wing activism, resulting in what was known as Operation Cold Storm in 1963, where over 100 left-wing activists were detained, and including a number of artists from the Greater Art Society. So from then onwards, um, artworks that were depicting the plight of the poor, the socially um, marginalised, uh, were deemed to be not conducive by the authorities for building social cohesion and consensus and from the 1960s onwards there were few artists who produced this type of works and even fewer people who wanted to be associated with the social realist groups. In contrast, artists who were producing this kind of fusion works continued to find support uh, in the post-independence period. Uh, this was no surprise because multiculturalism was in fact regarded as a key part of Singapore's national identity by the government of the day. And if you recall, uh, the founding Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew's words in 65, he was uh, it's very certain that what they were going to have was a multiracial country in Singapore. Uh, not a Malay nation, not a Chinese nation, not an Indian nation, but one where everyone uh, will have their place. And so after independence, we started to see a gradual acknowledgement of the importance of the arts for nation building by the government. And by 1976, uh, there was a new annex that was uh, created for the, na the, new, the National Museum in Singapore. So this was known as the National Museum Art Gallery. So this was Singapore's first art space with customized spaces and professional staff devoted to the visual arts. Eventually in 79, the government also started a scheme known as the Cultural Medallion which was the nation's highest award to be given to living artists. And by the 1980s, the Ministry of Culture also initiated a quite important series of exhibitions known as uh, Pioneer Artists. And in this series of exhibitions, they paid tribute to key artists like Chang Su Pei, Liu Kang, Chairman Si, Roger Chen, and Lin Cheng Ho. And many of these, the exhibition uh, organizers uh, regarded these individuals as having paved the way uh, for younger artists to emerge. So we can see over the next few decades there was going to be scholarly, more scholarly recognition for this type of fusion artworks. We could say that a, a landmark exhibition took place in 1979 when the National Art Gallery in Malaysia held their exhibition Pamera Retrospective, Pelukis Pelukis Nanyang, uh, which in, uh, is a Malay title, which in English reads as retrospective exhibition on Nanyang painters. And in this exhibition, uh, this was the first time uh, a scholarly treatment was given to study what was what the exhibition curators regarded as a very significant art movement that took place in Malaya. Uh, this first emerged in the 1930s and uh, peaked in the 1960s, uh, just uh, before Singapore eventually separated from the Federation of Malaya in 65. And within this exhibition, uh, they identified, identified a number of key practitioners, including uh, artists like Chong Su Peng and Chua Ten Ting. And this exhibition, in fact, identified the sources of the fusion uh, that was much mentioned in the early days. Uh, and in this exhibition, they pinpointed it to the coming together of the Shanghai school tradition found in Chinese ink painting together with the School of Paris movement uh, that was evident in uh, Western modern art. So the 1979 exhibition described these works uh, as Nanyang art rather than Malayan art. And uh, although Nanyang and Malaya were used interchangeably uh, by the Chinese in Singapore um, in, during the colonial period, but Nanyang by 1979 had become more or less a historical term. Um, we can understand why the exhibition organizers used Nanyang art instead of Malayan art because really the exhibition intended to pay tribute to the Nanyang Academy of Fine Arts, who the organizers felt had played a critical role in the early beginnings of modern art in Singapore and Malaya. And for the exhibition curators, they felt that uh, this group of artists uh, that created this type of fusion works uh, were much influenced by ideas of uh, modern art which they had absorbed when they were students in Shanghai in the 1920s, 1930s in China and uh, they were reflecting more of that kind of ethos rather than responding explicitly or directly to the decolonization movement in Singapore and Malaya in the 50s. 
So over time, Nanyang Art and its associations with multicultural fusion started to gain prominence within museum and curatorial circles. In the 1990s, the Singapore Art Museum had an exhibition uh, called Pont des Arts, uh, Nanyang Artists in Paris, looking at the contributions of Nanyang artists who had studied in France. And subsequently in Japan, uh, Fukuoka Asian Art Museum also had an exhibition in 2002, looking again specifically at the contributions of the Nanyang artists from the 50s to the 60s. And when we come to the 21st century, in 2015, with the establishment of the National Gallery in Singapore, we now have our very first long-term exhibition focusing on Singapore's art history. And this was seen in its uh, first exhibition on Singapore art, known as uh, Namasyaba Kamu, uh, What is Your Name? And in this narrative, there was one section that was really devoted to the emergence of Nanyang art in Singapore, which was described as being one of the earliest examples of a localized school of painting in Singapore. And this was the first time, uh, the first time in Singapore's art history, which shows a conscious attempt by artists to create a local uh, art discourse. So I would say that today, there is general acceptance of Nanyang art as Singapore's first localized art movement, but we I have to acknowledge that the process of its canonization was in fact a very complex one. Uh, fusion works were first created by a group of uh, China-born artists with very similar backgrounds, uh, but it was not a given that their fusion art would find a ready audience in Singapore, as you can see uh, from the early example of rejection uh, faced by Chua Tien Ting in Penang. Uh, it was this very fortunate encounter that these artists had with an group of influential art patrons uh, during the pre-independence period as well as curators and museums during the post-independence period that eventually recognised the significance of such fusion works. So an entire ecosystem of multiple stakeholders was really involved. In closing, I think we also have to acknowledge that there are certain limitations in using categories like uh, Malayan art or Nanyang art. Uh, for example, Nanyang art is a very Chinese-centric term Therefore, it would result in us omitting uh, the contributions of non-Chinese artists, for example, Malay artists like Suri Moyani, uh, when we talk about Singapore's uh, first art movement. Likewise, when people talk about Malayan art, uh, it tends to overlook the contributions of local-born Peranakan Chinese artists like Lo Kui Song and Lo Kui Su, uh, whose artworks don't quite fit within the definition of fusion art uh, as promoted by the uh, early patrons of the period. And of course, apart from artists and patrons, we also have to acknowledge that the roles played by local art societies, art education and the mass media also had important uh, contributions in the art scene prior uh, to the emergence of greater support from the state and from the government during the independence period. So further research into these areas, I'm sure, will help to deepen our understanding of uh, Singapore's art history as we move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lofibi, for your presentation. Uh, if anyone has any questions, we will have a 30 minutes Q&A session after the next lecture. ขอบคุณคุณโลซีบีสำหรับการบรรยายครับสำหรับท่านใดที่มีคำถามเราจะมีช่วงถามต่อให้ประมาณ 30 ขอแนะนำวิทยากรท่านต่อไปศาสตราจารย์แพทริกฟอร์ดฟลอเรสซึ่งจะมานำเสนอหัวข้ออินแดนและภูมิภาควัฒนธรรมและธรรมชาติ
I would like to invite Professor Patrick Flores to present the topic, Land and Region, Culture and Nation, Collecting in the Islands. So, Professor Flores is a professional of artist studies at the Department of Art uh, Studies at the University of the Philippines and concurrently deputy director at the National Gallery Singapore. He is the director of the Philippine Contemporary Art Network. He was a visiting fellow at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. in 1989. Among his publications are Painting History Revisions in Philippine Colonial Art, 1999, Past Peripheral Creation in Southeast Asia, 2008, Art After War, 1948 to 1969, 2015, and Raimundo Abano Text, 2017. He was a guest scholar at Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles in 2014. He was a, the artistic director of the Singapore Biennale in 2019 and curator of the Taiwan Pavilion at the Venice Biennale in 2022. Please, Professor Flores. Thank you, thank you, Pang Min, for the introduction and good morning to everyone. I would like to begin. Uh, I would like to begin this talk on collectors with, with a painting that depicts a collector within a painting, uh, which in turn is currently in the collection of another collector. The painting is titled Kundiman, referring to the plaintive, patriotic, and romantic Philippine song painted by the academic forerunner Fabian de la Rosa in 1936 and is in what may be the most extensive collection in the Philippines. The Paulino Hetti K collection, which spans the archaeological and the contemporary. And here you see uh, this, collections, uh, this collection featured uh, uh, in art and observation. The said work unfolds a scene in a living room of an affluent family in which a woman sings, accompanied by a pianist, and around her an audience uh, intently listens including a man in a white suit, presumed to be the culturatus of the town, the collector of the work, the owner of the mansion, and the ophthalmologist who treated the eye ailment of the artist. The furnishings of the room betray colonial wealth derived from Spanish and American colonial eras in the Philippines, as seen in the attire of the figures and the accoutrements of Western and perhaps cosmopolitan leisure or luxury like the piano, the carpet, the lamp, the tiles, the bentwood chairs, and the paintings on the wall. The entire house itself is a testimony to this economic and cultural capital, a structure that references the stately home of the collector Santos, which is exemplary of art deco with Victorian aspects. The subject of the painting is an event within a room that cites an actual house in a province north of the capital, Manila. It is important to speak to this uh, representation, but also to the means by which the representation is made possible in its nuanced, if not granular, uh, material sense. It leads us to reflect on a methodology of studying the practice of collecting and the social lives of collectors as embedded in the object itself and not regarded as an external institution to be isolated from, intimate, from the intimate constitution of the subject of desire and to be critiqued as an alienating economy. This sense of the interior and the internalization of objects are not lost on the critique. Uh, okay, this scene of the interior and the internalization of objects are not lost on the critic Alice Guillermo, who points out that in the, enhancements, in the enhancement of the mood of the her internal absorption and quiet appreciation, the faces of the listeners on the left are set against the open space outside from which emanates the soft warmth of the sunlight translated into the emotional warmth of the artistic experience, end of quote. 
I am drawn to the dynamic between the internal absorption of the artistic experience and the warmth of the sunlight that comes from outside permeates the room and ultimately aestheticizes the moment in which a lavish interior opens into first a porch covered by an inclined canopy and finally to a lush landscape. Staged in this picture is the relationship between the culture of the senses and the cultivation of land, between the attractiveness of natural life that is extracted via colonialism and class society and the human sensibility towards uh, prestigious possessions, a discriminating agency that is privileged as the consummation of aesthetic education and in anticipation, perhaps, of the sovereignty of the Philippine nation. This observation on a painting informs what I will share today in this, in this conference. And I'd like to thank the organizers for the invitation and the hospitality. It is a preliminary effort to set up coordinates in a possible mapping of collecting in a particular region in the Philippines, the central islands of the, of the reserve. I identify in this survey agents of collecting whose biographies prove to be symptomatic of the projects that underlie the accumulation of art. So, alongside it is the mystification of property as well as the values which are broadly conceived and not confined to financialization that accrue to the property. I will sketch out the contours of the history and ethos of their collective disposition and then propose a range of cognates with the political economy of national formation mainly after the Pacific War. So first I present the network of collectors as they are situated in the Visayas, the Central Islands in the Philippines, as I mentioned. The identification of the Visayas as a specific location of collecting shifts the focus away from Manila. This procedure is not meant to estrange the islands, but to introduce an aspect to the methodology of collecting, his of collecting history that is sensitive to both particularization and also of constellation with the view of configuring a matrix of relations across spaces within a vicinity connected to other vicinities elsewhere. So let me now introduce these collectors in very general terms. The first is Jorge Vargas, was part of the first graduates of the Luz Law School at the University of the Philippines in 1914. He was appointed Executive Secretary of Manuel Quezon, the Philippine President during the American Commonwealth period beginning in 1935. Within government, Vargas held other positions in the Departments of Defense and Agriculture, <coughs> among others. He was mayor of Manila during the Japanese occupation, who was at that time the highest official of the Philippine government. Vargas was passionately involved as well in regional and international sports and scouting movement endeavors that prepared the global mind. Body. Vargas collected a, a range of materials, art, stamps, coins, historical documents, books, and memorabilia. His art collection covers an extensive period of Philippine art history from the late Hispanic period to early Philippine modernism. He donated his collection to the uh, University of the Philippines uh, and uh, Jorge Vargas uh, Museum and Filipiniana Research Center opened in 1987. And recently we did a, a curated the Vargas for 10 years and uh, recently we, we, uh, we came up with a catalog of, uh, of the collection. The next uh, and the interesting in relation also to the issue of land and agriculture uh, uh, Vargas wrote this interesting essay on the philosophy of the Filipino peasant. The next uh, uh, collector is Poeta Calo Ledesma, was born to the scholar Teodoro Calo and to the women's rights advocate, beauty queen, Purificacion William Herba Calo. She studied fine arts and education at the University of the Philippines and pursued further studies in art and design at the University of Michigan. She wrote a thesis on Philippine modern art 
which uh, uh, became a, uh, a book titled uh, Struggle for Philippine, Philippine Art. Carlo Redesma was the founding president of the Art Association of the Philippines in 1948 and managed a family real estate company, L.P. Carlo Incorporated. Her art and archival collection are significant resources of Philippine modern art. Over the years, she was able to collect 83 scrapbooks containing clippings and art-related activities from newspapers and magazines, notes, invitations, posters, letters, photographs, and other forms of ephemera. So this is an interesting comparison between Vargas and uh, Edesma, uh, showing them uh, amidst their collection of Western painting, also of uh, Oriental, Oriental artifacts. There uh, was an uh, exhibition at the Vargas uh, comparing the two, uh, created by Luis Marcelino, uh, titled Aligning Histories, uh, looking at the collection of Vargas and uh, Ledesma, Carlo Ledesma. The next collector is Eugenio Lopez Sr., who was at the helm of the business empire, the Lopez group of companies that belonged to a prominent political family in the Visayas. There was a time when this empire significantly controlled the country's electricity, water, and media. Lopez founded the Lopez Museum and Library in, in uh, 1960, regarded as a pioneer in museums in the Philippines that were uh, previously private collections. The Lopez holdings consist of rare maps and manuscripts from the 16th century onwards and periodicals from the 19th and early 20th century alongside excavated Philippine pottery and important works of Philippine colonial and modern art as well as personal artifacts of the national hero, uh, Jose, Jose Rizal. The next collector is Luis Maria Araneta, who was an architect and a heritage con conservationist, collector and decorator. In his childhood, he started to collect cigar rings, uh, stamps, uh, postcards, matchbox covers, among others. On this initial trove, he built a vast collection of Philippine colonial art and, and religious objects, some, some of which are now under the care of the San Agustin Museum. His only son, Gregorio, married Irene Marcos, the youngest daughter of Ferdinand and Pimenta Marcos. Next collector uh, is, is, uh, is, is now under the care of the San Agustin Church and Museum. The next collectors are Leandro and Cecilia Luxin. Leandro Luxin was an architect, artist, and designer. While he formally studied music, he became Philippine modern architecture's most prolific. One of uh, a Philippine, uh, he became Philippine modern architecture's most prolific practitioner. The cultural center of the Philippines is uh, his most recognizable achievement. His wife, Maria Cecilia Araneta Yulo, was uh, the daughter of former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, Jose Yulo, whose family owned the sprawling and Lubang Sugar Estate. The collection of the Luxin couple includes Philippine art, Chinese porcelain, archaeological objects, and seashells. This is uh, Luxin's uh, famous uh, emblematic work, the cultural center of the Philippines, a plain child of the first lady, the uh, Inanta Marcos. I include in this discussion a painting in the collection of the Luxin couple that was donated to the Philippine National Museum. It portrays the assassination of Governor General Bustamante with the Spanish friars for grounding the conflict between church and state in the Spanish colonial period in the Philippines. Such conflict may be traced to the appropriation of land by the religious orders at the expense of the elite and the efforts of some state officials like Bustamante to loosen the grip of religious hegemony over the colony. This internal contradiction between colonialism partly instilled in the masses in the elite a revolutionary consciousness, inevitably bringing forth the Philippine Republic to be led by an elite who spiritedly, spiritedly wanted a peace of the land. This political economic situation, the extension, created the wealth that the Loxin family had disposed to acquire a painting of this, of this architecture. 
next collector is Roberto Villanueva, was a tycoon and journalist. He was the son of Manuel and Eugenia Villanueva. He worked in the media, sugar, and power industries and was associated with Eugenia Lopez. Villanueva's collection was eclectic. It began with art and expanded to ceramics, which were considered to comprise one of the most comprehensive inventories of Chinese and Southeast Asian trade wear, with more than 500 pieces from the 9th up to the 19th century. The next collector is Ramon Ophelenia, was a leading personality in the field of heritage conservation in Silai, in Negros Occidental. He was one of the founders of the Silai Heritage Foundation, which worked towards the conservation and cultivation of local art and culture. The ancestral house, the ancestral house of his family became a museum in 1962. I recognize Ophelenia in this talk to reference the tendency for the house of the elite to become emblematic of a town's heritage and define both the museology and the tourism of the area. The next collector, oh, this is the uh, interior of the Ophelenia Museum in the Polisarius. The next collector is Imelda Marcos, was the first lady of the Philippines from 1965 to 86, wife of the president Ferdinand Marcos. She was a cultural, a central cultural and political figure in the Marcos government, having been the patron of the arts, as well as minister of human settlements, Governor of Metro Manila, member of the National Assembly. She also represented the Philippines in important diplomatic initiatives, playing a role in geopolitical affairs involving the former Soviet Union, China, and Libya, among others. Imelda Marcos uh, collected prodigiously from Western and Philippine art to shoes, from jewelry to silver. Jewelry. Shoes, <laughs> silver, in uh, uh, PU Abad installation, painting. And some of these paintings are at the Vargas Museum. When the Marcas government fell to an uprising in 1986, their assets were sequestered. Her art and silver collection, for instance, were put up for auction. A peculiar, <laughs> and some of these sequestered properties, are uh, with the Vargas Museum uh, in the University of the Philippines that include uh, Italian painting, uh, Russian lacquerware, uh, glass, reverse glass paintings, peasants uh, uh, from former Yugoslavia, uh, and uh, Byzantine icons. Byzantine icons, it is an eclectic collection. A peculiar interest among her varied eccentricities is the hybrid structure of her home province. In her home province in Tacloban, Leyte, which in the 60s crowned her as the Rose of Tacloban in a beauty pageant. Called the Santo Niño Shrine, it is a monument for the child Christ, a seminal image in the, Philipp in the Spanish colonization of the Philippines. It has two floors. The crown is a chapel for worship of the image. The second floor is her residence. And the museum of her life through dioramas and the embarrassment of her riches. Uh, this is a, uh, a portrait of Imelda by Basuki Abdullah. Painting. And the last uh, uh, collector is Philippe Louvillier. He's a diplomat, business leader, and philanthropist. He's the son of Henry Louvillier, who began his pawn shop business in Cebu, and which Philippe developed by opening branches in Manila to be known as Cebuana Louvillier. And uh, they diversified the enterprise to include remittance service. <coughs> In the collection of Louvillier are mainly religious paintings and artifacts from the 16th to 18th centuries, icons, ivory sculptures, sacred vessels, polychrome statues, liturgical vestments, and metalwork. The discussion of Louvillier in this presentation rounds out the network of collectors 
in the Visayas and signals of turning the economy from land economy that underlies accumulation. In Louis, Louis Lear's case, the remittance of overseas contract workers comes into play in the history of collecting uh, in the Philippines. From this sketch of the lay of the land, which is uh, very cursory and preliminary, of collecting in the Visayas, let me now foreground some themes for reflection and future study. Uh, first, why the Visayas? The Visayas, which has been part of the administration of the islands into three island, island groups, was the entry point of Spanish colonizers um, in the 16th century who went through Leyte and Cebu before they settled in, in Manila. The inter-island formation may have also created conditions of autonomy and also of trade. According to Brigadier General William Carter, writing in 1905, and I quote, the Visayan Islands constitute the most important group of the Philippines from a commercial point of view, for nearly all the sugar and great part of hemp exported from the archipelago are produced in the Visayas. As I mentioned earlier, the focus on the Visayas decenters Manila as the primary locus of collecting. But the challenge in discussing Visayas is how to link it to the collecting practice in Manila, which was a best represented by the vanguard collector, dealer, and restorer Alfonso Ping of uh, Chinese uh, lineage. In terms of methodology, one of the concerns is how to bring art history into a productive conversation with the political economy of the Philippine Republic caught in the transition from the Spanish colonial to American imperialist periods and the movement towards independence after the Pacific War. So I asked the question, what kind of social structure governing the post-colony um, supported collecting? It is interesting for the economic historian, Onofre Corpus, to claim that, and I quote him, the Filipinos had had no formal national and provincial administration during the Spanish era. Their organizational skills were most conspicuous in the conduct of annual fiestas of saints at the pueblo or town level. Thus, the revolution started without a national political organization, end of quote. In light of this assessment of corpus, it could be ventured that the civic technology through which collecting became possible was the administration of festivals, largely centered on the activities of the church, in which creative production like art, ornament, and performance was, was paramount. Central in the discussion of structure is the sugar industry, which from which much of the wealth that sustained collecting came from. Let me quote at length the historical annotation of John Larkin on the Philippine sugar industry. I quote him, from its modest origins in the 19th century, the sugar industry emerged as one of the archipelago's economic giants. In 1920, in 1920 it represented almost one-third of all Philippine foreign trade. Moreover, the industry boasted the island's most advanced manufacturing technology. For all its economic strength, however, the sugar business was vulnerable because its prosperity depended largely on world demand and access to the duty-free U.S. market. While improved milling facilities represented a degree of industrial modernity to the Philippines, they did not stimulate growth of other kinds of processing, save distilling, end of quote. In the literature on sugar in the Philippines, the discourse of modernity is raised as in the is as in the book of Lark. But in the more popular imagination fed by the lifestyle press, it is the grandeur of the house that shapes the metaphor and steps from a lucrative but also precarious commodity of sugar. Part of this grandeur were the lavish parties, the lavish parties that desired the some of the pages from the book of, this is a recent book, Houses that Sugar Field, that came out this year. And, and uh, some of the examples of these houses. So the lavish parties that the Visayan went through to celebrate their status, like the Kahit of Paul. So the Visayan elite held these parties in Manila to celebrate their status, like Kahit of Paul, held in Manila by the leading families from the from the 
Now, this initial investment in sugar, the Philippine really expanded to real estate and inevitably to mono monopoly capitalism. The same elite that was dispossessed of land with established religious structure and took part in their revolution. The inaugural constitution of the Philippine Republic in 1899 restored the property amassed by the religious establishment to the Philippine state. According to the scholar Joseph Fradera, when the Americans took control of the archipelago in 1901, religious orders controlled some 400,000 acres of land. This explains the history of the uneven distribution of land as well as the radicalization of the Philippine population. This being said, the historian Filopeno Aguilar points to the autonomy that the elite from Negros Occidental in the Val and the Visayas uh, cultivated within Spanish colonialism. According to him, and I quote Aguilar, for all intents and purposes, the colonial state was irrelevant in unruly Negros or every hacienda or estate isolated by poor transportation and infrastructure sought to be its own power center. Negros disrupted the established church plaza or town square complex found in municipal centers in other parts of the Spanish Philippines, where a social prestige was normally measured by proximity to the local representation of tangible Spanish power. Several asideros or estate holders in Negros erected their well-built houses on their agenda premises far from the town center. End of quote. He goes on to say that, and I quote, paradoxically, Negros, where the state was riddled with contradictions, thrived in its anarchic way as many seized opportunities to maximize their individual economic interests, each one undermining the state amid the island's direct articulation in the global economy. End of quote. As intimated earlier by John Larkin, the other side of the dominance of the sugar barons in the Visayas was the failure of the elite to industrialize. This detail of discussion needs to be further fleshed out in, in another paper. As it, as it relates the residual feudal and colonial habits in society with the dominant perspectives on art and its collection that are for the most part tied to antiquarian connoisseurship, the idealizations of heritage in the developmentalist register, the fetishization of, of the achievement, the technical achievement, and the unacknowledged colonialism in the appreciation of the artistic sublime. The first concern pertains to the evolution of the language of cultural capital that informed claims to national patrimony. The private collective model became a Filipino collective through the collection and the production of the discourse of heritage to be broadly named Filipiniana or everything Philippine, which is articulated variously. To cite examples, the house of the elite becomes a repository of heritage linked to tourism, or the study of art and culture is limited to the exaltation of canonical objects, or Filipino identity is split from the differentiations of class, ethnicity, or gender in the social context. Among the collectors mentioned in this talk, it was Jorge Vargas who was the most attentive to the deliberation of the Filipino. Filipino. <clears throat> the convergence between market and state <clears throat> found a watershed in the patronage of the arts and culture of the first lady, Imelda Marcos. Imelda's art collection was vast and mingled with state property. Much of it was seized by the successor of government of Corazon Aquino, who incidentally was once a treasurer of her family's own sugar plantation, and auctioned to fund Aquino's comprehensive land reform program. So the art pieces of Imelda were auctioned to fund Aquino's comprehensive land reform program. Imelda's collection, which includes her favorite shoes, has been dispersed and uh, mingled and mixed with the collections of institutions like the Cultural Center of the Philippines and the Metropolitan Museum of Manila. This being said, the access of the elite collectors to the mechanisms of state capture was already present even before the Pacific War when a figure like Jorge Vargas or a family like that of Lopez held positions in the executive, judicial, and legislative branches of government. 
Another discourse to emerge from, the, from this survey of collectors is modernity. The collectors built up their collection guided by the self-consciousness for varying levels of Philippine identity, which was evolving, uh, which was evolving as an index of a modernist project. In these collections as well were examples of modern art, which art historically marked as a post-negation of and progression from conservative art. Purita Kahlo de Desma was a vocal supporter of modernism and so were Jorge Vargas, Eugenio Lopez, and Imelda Marcos. The practice itself of Leandro Loxin was thoroughly modernist. Finally, to suggest a vector away from the national through the study of collecting in the Visayas, I end this talk with two possible trajectories into the international, which proved to be simultaneously a loop into an earlier Spanish colonialism. These vectors, these vectors are the cousins Fernando Sobel and Alfonso Osorio of the of formidable Spanish ancestry. While Sobel was not from the Visayas, he had close professional relationships with Purita Calore Desma and Yandro Lucy. For his part, Osorio's family owned a sugar mill in Negros Occidental where he painted the famous Amy Christ at the St. Joseph the Carpenter Church at Victoria's Milling. Both Osorio and Sobel were exceptional artists, remarkable intellectuals, and intense collectors. Sobel donated his modern art collection, uh, wrote this book, sorry, wrote this book, <coughs> in 1963, and donated his modern art collection to the Ateneo de Manila University in 1960 and the Museum of Spanish Abstract Art in Cuenca in Spain in 1966, which is a museum hanging on the cliff during Franco's era and initially thought of founding the Ayala Museum in Manila in 1967. For his part, Osorio collected the works of Jean de Buffet, you can see these works here, and Jackson Pollock, there's Pollock in this picture, who was his close friend, as well as conifers, as well as conifers, which they say is more expensive. The conifers than the plant, uh, or cold bearing seed plants in his estate in East, in East Hampton, in Long Island, in New York. Which housed, which housed his art and also his arboreto. This is the church where Osorio painted uh, this is the mill, the sugar mill, the church of the sugar mill, and this is the Lady Christ uh, that uh, Osorio painted in 1950. I end this talk by speaking to the methodological aspiration that seeks to embed the collective ethos in the production and circulation of art through the work of Osorio that exemplifies his series of assemblages called congregation. In his queer mind, congregations were assemblies or even a surplus of sundry objects from plastic toys to petrified parts of animals. They all work together, according to Osorio, in which all may include bones and eyes, of fish or bird or other. Their state in the assemblage is one moment in the life as the artist continues in the code, either the bone disintegrates or it's fused into the picture. It's a step in the continuity, it is not dead, it is continuing. And of course, the collection as a congregation may offer a method of implication in which the motley details of the world's material and living culture come together intention as well as in beauty, supported by the economic access to these materials, but also overlooked by the normative narratives of modernism while being reclaimed in the same breath by the emergent modernities of post-colonial history and the materialist analysis of the political economy of collections. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Flores, for your presentation. Thank you, Professor Flores, for your presentation.
ต่อไปจะเป็นช่วงถามตอบสำหรับการบรรยายในช่วงเช้าครับ Next will be a Q&A session for the, the morning part. Thank you, Farmin, for your uh, wonderful moderating. So I would like to invite the three speakers of the morning session, uh, Professor Natalie Hanich, uh, Mr. Lo Siwi, and Professor Patrick Flores on the stage for a short Q&A session. So thank you very much once again for the wonderful presentations on patronage in the Western world in Singapore and in the Philippines. So next I would like to open the floor for a Q&A session and if anyone uh, have any questions or want to share your thoughts, please feel free to do so. It can be in English or in Thai. I, I can be a translator. อ่าเดี๋ยวต่อไปจะเป็นช่วงคําตอบนะคะต้องขอขอบคุณวิทยากรทั้ง แชร์ความคิดเห็นได้ในทั้งภาษาไทยและภาษาอังกฤษนะคะถ้าอยากจะถามเป็นภาษาไทยก็เดี๋ยวจะแปลเป็นภาษาอังกฤษให้อีกท
and since we signed the contract, the price of NFTs became lower and lower and lower. <laughs> so we are very happy to have signed the contract because we were afraid that the publisher we didn't want to publish it anymore. Uh, so um, we, we try to understand the reasons why um, there is such a, um, an interest for this very special something which can be called a thing, special uh, devices, let's say. Um, and uh, so, of course, there are several reasons which have to do with uh, novelty, with mm, speculation, uh, maybe even with aesthetic reasons, although this is probably the most well, difficult uh, issue with, with uh, NFT. Um, and as for myself, I concluded in my paper that there are some um, evidences of the beginning of artification, for example, the fact that in the Centre Pompidou last year there has been an exhibition of NFTs, uh, the Musée National d'Armodern has bought NFTs, and you could have the same phenomenon in other countries. Uh, so this is a, a beginning of clue for the notification process, but there are also obstacles to this notification process, and, and uh, well, I list them in, 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 my, in my paper, and we can see that these obstacles are being now uh, uh, obvious uh, since the uh, price of the NFTs have been totally uh, uh, crawling. Uh, at the same time as uh, any kind of bitcoins, the same phenomenon, but maybe in a more pronounced way because there is uh, a claim for NFTs to be uh, treated as artworks, and this brings very special conditions. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> any more questions, or comments, or response? Thank you. Um, my name is Fadid and I'm from Faculty of Political Science at the Laboratory University. I have a first question to Professor Helen. <laughs> um, the idea is that you, you mentioned in your uh, uh, speech that um, contemporary art became strongly born to action. And what it means exactly to collecting contemporary art for you know, uh, young uh, entrepreneur or a collector, there are a variety of um, collectors. Some try to collect art according to their identity. Is that uh, really the same way that they try to explain to us? Can you elaborate a little bit more for this issue? Thank you. Um, I'm going to try to answer. Um, I hope it will answer your question. It's not something I developed in the third chapter of my book, Le Paradigme de la Contemporaine Paradigme. I think that from the mid-90s, something new appeared, which is very much bound to the financialization of art, no, the financialization of the, uh, the economic world in general, which is, you know, all these possibilities to get a lot of money in a short time. And this fine, new financial conditions uh, uh, have been very much concerned a uh, younger generation and uh, not the old people who slowly made a fortune as before, but young people who could very quickly make a fortune. So have a lot of money to spend uh, and can have the possibility to spend their money in expensive cars or expensive houses and so on. But with art, there is the possibility to add speculation to 
outward uh, sign of wealth as seen in exterior donations in French. Okay, so art, I think, is a good way to spend money when you're very rich, rather young, and with uh, maybe a scarce culture of the history of arts, you don't need to have, you know, learn who is Poussin, who is, uh, you know, the old masters and so on. Uh, because a new kind of art uh, arrived in front of the art team at the same time, which are uh, with the uh, young British artists and Jeff Koons and all this art well, that has been um, showed at the uh, famous uh, uh, exhibition uh, sensation at the end of the 90s. So this new tendency in art, very sensational, very transgressive, very impressive, uh, works very well with people who do not have a lot of culture in the history of art, but are extremely impressed you know, by you know, this kind of works. And so this mixture of artistic proposals who are very uh, interesting and, and acceptable by these young people, and this new category of potential collectioners has um, induced this new phenomenon of a lot of money spent of very spe special artworks, not all the artworks, but these ones, and with a sudden rise in the market for these kind of works. So it's a very interesting phenomenon which mixes sociology and economics. And I think this is why um, uh, the art world in contemporary art has been so close with luxury at this moment. Whereas uh, one generation before, luxury was considered you know, something totally vulgar by artists, and even the fact to earn money was considered vulgar. Uh, you know, I use in my book the uh, memories of uh, Christian Boltowski, who declares in the volume of, of interviews that when he was a young artist, you know, at the beginning of the 70s, something like that, uh, among all his peers, his friends, artists, and so on, the one who, who sold was considered a very bad artist. You know, it was cool to sell. To sell. <laughs> so things have totally changed, you know, in one generation with this new phenomenon, which I think is sociologically very interesting to observe. Thank you. Uh, second question I'd like to address to both uh, Professor Forrest and Mr. Law. Um, the idea is that um, I was impressed by the work of Juan Luna when I was in the National Gallery of the Philippines. And uh, what happened to him uh, in terms of the national identity, you know, collecting uh, Juan Luna's work? Because I'm um, considering in the Southeast Asian experience, Philip, uh, Philip North artist is uh, probably the first group of Southeast Asians to go to artists in the Western world. Uh, in compare with them, uh, even Chinese artists, or, you know, even Japanese artists, and many of them, for example, Japanese artists went to Paris and cannot embrace the Western environment, and you know they, they surrender, and came back to Japan, started uh, practicing the way traditional Japanese art in comparing uh, Jap uh, Chinese probably more uh, challenging for them and more adaptable for them. I don't know, but uh, it's really interesting to see uh, the, such an iconic artist in Koruna uh, and his place in the national artistry and also the contemporary images of Koruna, for example. But at the same time, talking about the, the Singaporean experience, is there any other than so-called Chinese artists, as you mentioned in the really last uh, part of your presentation, that uh, some uh, non-Chinese-born artists like uh, omitted, uh, disregarded, or unrecognized from the Nanyang group? Is there any possibility to retell really the story of these uh, people? Thank you, Nandit, for that question. Uh, Luna question is a big question. 
this role in Philippine artistry is very important, uh, not maybe too important, <laughs> or uh, as even as given, uh, we privileged it, I would I say it as a, as, as a link of uh, local art to, to Western art through the uh, triumph of uh, his work in 1984 at, at, the, at the Madrid Exposition. So this is one way to look at Luca as a kind of uh, index of master of the of the Western of the Western medium, of the Western language of painting. But on the other hand, people can also see the work of Luna as some kind of critique of, of, of colonialism because he was able to transform a uh, canonical form to uh, allegorical form, allegorical form, to to to, uh, to turn uh, historic history painting, for instance, into an allegory of Spanish colonialism in, in the Philippines. So there are many ways that Luna was part of the revolutionary history, so uh, but he was also part of this culmination of aesthetic education uh, through. Colonialism, so it's 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 not easy to uh, 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 reduce Luna to one of the other. So what I'm trying to say is that there should be a more complex appreciation of Luna's place in history. Yeah, um, thank you for your question. I think uh, you're right. Was this concern in the writing of a Singapore art history that uh, by putting a lot of emphasis on Nanyang art and adopting the definition uh, that many uh, writers have adopted, which is this idea of fusion, uh, multicultural aesthetics, that we run into the risk of omitting or overlooking the contributions of other artists who were in the scene at the same time. So we do acknowledge that there were other uh, non-Chinese artists uh, working or active in the Singapore art scene. They were also exhibiting, uh, they were also collected. Uh, but I guess in terms of numbers, they are far fewer compared to the Chinese, uh, the Latin Chinese artists. And uh, it is true that they don't exhibit, that their works don't exhibit this fusion uh, element. So I think the, the challenge for scholars now art historians uh, of this generation we need to see how we can expand or look at the uh, development of Singapore's uh, art movements, particularly the early art movements in a more open and inclusive way and not be too caught up uh, with coming up with very like, defined or closed definitions uh, such as this idea of fusion uh, because once you are fixated on that then we always run into the problems of blind spots and not being able to uh, include other artists who are obviously practicing uh, during the same time period. So, My name is Ricardo Sopunga. I would like to ask about the maybe interest or uh, relationship between the Bertones and uh, production of critical uh, discord, uh, maybe more specifically in uh, artists. Uh, would there be any uh, interest of the Bertones to, to this kind of Louder, please. Uh, okay. Um, uh, I would like to ask a question. Uh, maybe the interest between the role of the image and the production of a critical discourse, uh, more specifically uh, art criticism. Uh, would there be uh, any interest uh, maybe in the history of uh, of the activity in uh, South Asia or maybe in Europe on, on this kind of uh, relation between the image and art criticism?
Southeast Asia. That is like, a very interesting question, the relationship between patronage and art criticism. Yeah, there is. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, one can say that the, uh, these collections, private collections, became public institutions, uh, ultimately formed the basis of uh, the museum system. Of uh, the variety of objects these collections had, and also the, the way these objects were classified. Uh, so, so uh, and many of these uh, collectors uh, also supported the discourse of art. So, like Purita, for instance, Purita Kalo, it is now who uh, founded the Art Association of the Philippines, sponsored that. Uh, Art criticism competition. So, uh, this is an important element in the discourse to support the emergence of modernity in the Philippines. So, there was a great deal of scholarship built around the understanding of collections by collectors themselves. But as I mentioned in my talk, the scholarship was largely based on, on connoisseurship or the like antiquarian appreciation of of prestigious possession. So that was also, that's also a problem that has, uh, that has haunted the current state of scholarship. So we wouldn't seem to get away from the formalist approach to the appreciation of, of objects and also overlooking the colonial political economy that made the production uh, possible. But definitely scholarship uh, as part of the production of this course for these objects. Like a good example would be Fernando Sobe, who was a scholar and writer of, of art uh, as much as he was an uh, artist and, and, and collector. Um, I guess in the context of Singapore, uh, I think the strongest that we can find between, say, a patron and someone who was uh, more scholarly. It's <coughs> a book from uh, Professor Michael Sullivan. I mean, he comes from a background of uh, being an art historian. Uh, so he was also a curator at the museum and uh, wrote about uh, artworks and about artists uh, in quite a scholarly manner. So in that sense, uh, He's quite possible nexus, and uh, he often spoke about or described the Singapore artists as part of a, a larger cohort of Chinese modern painters who he was most familiar with. Um, but I would say that he didn't quite take on the role of being an art critic. Uh, many of the early patrons, if they did write uh, in a forum, uh, they saw themselves more as trying to encourage small and growing art scene uh, rather than trying to take a more critical role. So in the context of Singapore, I have to say that uh, it was only perhaps from the 1980s onwards when we have uh, art historians and curators like Mr. T.K. Sapapati, uh, then he, he, his um, writings tend to take on a more uh, art critical stance. But prior to that, uh, most of the patrons in Singapore uh, didn't quite play that role. Thank you very much. Hamin Ka, Choi Ma Tong Chana Nipin Ka. Thank you all for your presentations. Um, I have a question for Mr. Lo and also a question for Professor Flores. Uh, for Mr. Lo, um, the artists you spoke about have for some time been accepted as a kind of a canon of modern art in Singapore, whereas the collectors you spoke about have come into, into public view more recently um, through exhibitions at both the Universal Museum and National Gallery Singapore that have uh, honoured the role that those collectors have played in, in establishing the collections. Um, my question is what do you think might change as uh, the institutions in Singapore perhaps pay more attention to the role of these early patrons and collectors about how might that change the way we um, tell the story of modern art in Singapore? Um, 
And for Professor Flores, my question is, I wonder if you could speak a little more about the relationship between the Visayas and Manila. Because if I understood correctly, you suggested that your focus on um, the collectors in the Visayas was a way of shifting attention away from Manila. And yet, as I understand it, almost all of the collectors that you spoke about had a very prominent role, pro prominent public role uh, in Manila. So it seems to me that by shifting attention away to the Visayas, you are also inevitably returning our attention to the capital. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, good question. Um, I'm not quite sure uh, what the future might be in terms of how we uh, have a better or different understanding of Singapore art history as uh, our institutions in Singapore uh, look more at uh, other players in the ecosystem besides artists. So, the, I guess, uh, an interesting area of research in the future might be to look more closely at the relationship between artists and patrons. I think this is an area that has been little examined and uh, perhaps might be not so possible to go back in time and look at the relationship between uh, modern artists uh, and the early patrons, but uh, I think in the more recent times, uh, I would think that it's uh, very useful if museums and curators could pay more attention to how contemporary artists and contemporary art patrons are kind of embedded in a relationship and how these relationships play out in the production and the reception of contemporary art today. Thank you, Roger, for the question. Uh, the reason I, I looked at Visayas as the location of collectors is the fact that many of the country's important collectors really came from, from the Visayas. So uh, I might have probably been looking at the source of wealth, which was, which was the Visayas. But you are right, the, the Visayas, they, these collectors were not uh, isolated from the uh, uh, political processes uh, in, in Manila. And I also mentioned in the paper that I didn't wish to estrange the Visayas from the rest of the country, only to say that there was a, a specific articulation of collection in the islands. And, uh, one, one way to study that is to study, is to study the formation of, of wealth in the Visayas, which was part of, of colonial history. And uh, also the, uh, uh, the relationship between the Visayas and the national formation in Manila through institutionalization of, of certain structures, like, let us say, the museum. So the wealth was in the Visayas, but the collection would be in Manila. And as well as the institutionalization in the museum, like the Lopez Museum, the Ayala Museum, the Vargas Museum, uh, uh, would be in Manila. So I just wanted to, uh, to create that relay of, uh, of uh, the production of, of institutions of museums, uh, collections from the source of the wealth and the migration of that source to the capital and maybe later the international context through the Fusogel, Osorio and maybe Imelda Marcos. So uh, I wanted to parse the, the elements of the, of the process so that it doesn't become by default a Manila affair and also by default simply an affair in the Visayas. And there's also a typification of the Visayan ethos as the Visayan as lavish, as more, you know, maybe more prone to parties. I come from the Visayas, and, uh, but I don't have a collection. So, uh, but yes, there's that certain Visayan ethos, maybe 
island thing. I'm, I'm not sure yet, but I'm also looking at the possibility of a sensibility emerging from an inter island formation in the besides. And of course, the, the, the history and culture of, of sugar. And in, in, in Imelda's case of, of fiber and textile, which could translate to, of course, finery and uh, uh, costume and the time. Fashion, of course. Okay. Thank you very much for the, um, for the answers. Yes. I have a question to uh, the first. It can be the same to be asked uh, for. Uh, second project. I try to draw the comparison with uh, what happened in Indonesia. We see in Indonesia that uh, politicians and uh, higher officials that uh, will act as collectors. Uh, we know that there will be famous connections uh, gathered by uh, Sukarno and by other politicians. And this didn't start uh, after uh, the late 60s or 70s, but we see that. Uh, the same was uh, continuing until the, the end of Sumatra uh, Iwa, uh, with officials buying a lot of uh, art and crafts, uh, uh, works, not only art, but crafts too. So uh, they, they had a uh, political endeavor, actually. They wanted to promote a national uh, art, a national craft, or which one too. They could even frame the decree themselves. So the question is do we see the same uh, in? Philippines and in Singapore, because those people they made they had collected collected pieces which was personal collections, actually. So they acted as as private collectors, but with uh, political purposes. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think you, you you see these convergences of you, uh, you see these convergences quite marked in in the history of collecting. The Philippines, where there was this first, there was this relationship between church and state, uh, church and state, the patronage of the church of colonial art, and then also of the elite taking on as the, uh, the patrons of, 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 of art in the 19th century, and later there was this relationship between the market and the state uh, with. Uh, uh, Market supplying uh, art, uh, art supplying the state with art, as in the case of uh, Imelda, Imelda Marcos. So um, it's, it's, it's a hard to, well, of course, it is possible to disentangle these elements church, the state, and the market, but I propose a more uh, intermingled approach in, in the study of collections. Philippines in which uh, uh, agents, agents of the state and agents of the market, of the private sector and the agents of the church come together to, 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 produce, this, uh, to produce this history. So, um, and uh, as, I, as I intimated in my, in my presentation, uh, the, um, I think this has, uh, the failure of the Philippine elite to industrialize uh, is, uh, could also be seen in relation to, to, to the history of, of collecting, to preserve a certain heritage uh, that uh, did not really fulfill the promise of, 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 of modernity. But yes, we, uh, because of the, the, uh, this, the capture of the elite of certain, uh, certain prerogatives of the state, it's quite confused way, to convoluted way to answer the question, but what I'm saying is that there is the, the, the linkage was very, very dense between, between the state and the non-state actors in, in the collective history of the Philippines. I guess in the case of Singapore,
the government continues to pay emphasis on highlighting the kind of multi-ethnic, multicultural makeup of uh, Singapore society. So as I mentioned, uh, there continues to be support for the Nanyang artists and the Nanyang narrative in the building of the national collection, in the showcasing of that story in the National Gallery Permanent Exhibition. And of course, uh, you know, in the contemporary field, when Singapore uh, took part in the Venice Biennale for the first time in 2001 in the Singapore Pavilion uh, for the very first showcase, uh, Singapore selected four artists, uh, two Chinese, uh, one Malay, and uh, one Eurasian artist. So there was there's always a kind of a conscious attempt to project and maintain that balance uh, in how we portray uh, our own identity in Singapore and overseas. Uh, but at the same time, I think the curators and the museums and institutions are also aware of the limitations of this kind of framework. Uh, that there should be always a more nuanced and open understanding. And so even within the National Gallery permanent display in the section that we talk about uh, that shows Nanyang Park, uh, the curators have deliberately inserted uh, artworks by non-Chinese artists, Malay artists, uh, in order to kind of provoke uh, the visitor to think more deeply about some of these uh, pre-existing discourses.
projects, breaking shows, things like that. Um, and he's not sure whether this could be called a form of patronage or not, but this is the situation in Thailand that he wished to, to share with you for the same kind of period. ก็ดีเอ่อมาบริษัทนะที่ผ่านมาเนี่ยที่ที่บริษัทเลยมีสัตว์ที่สโคปเลยเป็นบริษัทเอกชนที่ได้เงินก็ให้การสนับสนุน
a regional or international collaborative project that bring artworks um, and 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 involve the education development at the same time. Or do you have any um, ideas or or to have some examples? Maybe I can say a few words about the different situation. Um, I think maybe it's the country France where the uh, difference between private collectors and public uh, patronage has been the most um, important um, since the beginning of the 1980s where there has been very voluntary politics of uh, supporting contemporary artists and not more modern artists um, and this policy has brought on the front of the scene um, a, a kind of art um, which is oriented toward rather conceptual art, installations, performances, videos, and where painting has been very much um, put under the, um, the cover. Uh, and so this has um, in, um, provoked big, big uh, controversies with people saying that um, state art uh, has taken a very special turn which differs very much from what people are used to appreciate uh, and that uh, state art is totally um, diverging from, from the market. So there is a big, big, big controversy between partisans of modern art against contemporary art called state art and also between um, the, the private, private sector and the public sector. And so the, this discrepancy between private and public is very much uh, present in France today uh, with a lot of consequences. Thank you, Nato, for your uh, question. Uh, it's, I think it's best to historicize uh, state support, um, to locate it in specific historical periods. It's uh, maybe not so uh, productive to generalize uh, state support in a particular country. Then. So in the Philippines, uh, state support in, of the arts during uh, Imelda Marcos's time, it was uh, quite uh, particular period of, of, of state patronage uh, as part of the government's effort to project itself as modern and also as uh, international. So there was that uh, period. Now, uh, after the Marcoses were deposed in 86, there were, uh, the, the, the government established a, some kind of culture ministry initiated a more democratic approach to, to patronage. So to extend the support of the state to artists from all over the country, not only uh, artists in Manila, but artists in, in the region. So there was then uh, uh, like some kind of a uh, moving away from Imelda's uh, uh, consolidation to a more democratic uh, uh, support across the, the archipelago. And the other question about alternatives to patronage, I think uh, it's important to point out that the collectors I mentioned uh, uh, also collected archives. So I think the collection of archives, the collection of books, uh, library materials, uh, Resources for scholarship should be tied also to the collection of art. Corita Kahala was an archive, Vargas, Lopez, we all have archives, very important resources. So maybe we can also connect the collection of art, the collection of archival material, and also an interdisciplinary approach in Melita Marcos through the Cultural Center of the Philippines, situated the collection of art in the context of other 
artistic expression. So there was an interdisciplinary approach to, to, to picture views in that sense. Uh, and then finally, the link to heritage and tourism, that the collection defines a particular type of museology in a local area. For instance, the house in the Ophelia in, in Negros became the, like, one of the first museums in that, in, that, uh, in that area through the private collection. And then the structure was uh, as a house and now becomes part of this tourism, right? tourism initiative. So I think heritage and tourism can also be seen in the larger context of the history of collection. That the afterlife of the collection through uh, the heritage industry and tourism. <coughs> in terms of state support for the arts, uh, of course, having the funds to buy artworks is important. But I have to say that contrary to popular uh, conception, the national acquisition budget for Singapore is not that big. Right? So definitely in terms of what the country can buy from artists, uh, it will never be enough to support the livelihood of artists. Uh, and if you look at the National Gallery's collection, about 60 to 65 percent of the collection comes from donations, so it's not through purchases. So that's one point that I wanted to make, which is that uh, the state support in terms of art purchases is still quite small. So I think what the in what in Singapore the government has tried to put more resources into is in two areas. So one is um, arts housing. Uh, have surveyed many of the Singapore artists and one of the key problems facing Singapore artists, visual artists, uh, is the lack of space for them to practice in Singapore, uh, affordable uh, spaces. So that's how the government has come in. Over the years, we have added more and more, uh, more quiet, more and more buildings, uh, which they have converted to uh, rent out as uh, very affordable arts housing for Singapore artists to use, so the rental is kept very low, maybe about 10% of the market rate. Uh, but secondly, I think equally important has been the fact that uh, our National Gallery has also taken on the position of education, public education, particularly setting up permanent exhibition for Singapore art uh, in the building. So which means that any time of the year, any Singaporean wanting to understand more about Singapore art history, you can go into the National Gallery, it's free admission for Singapore citizens, and at a glance, they'll be able to understand, you know, get a good overview of uh, Singapore art history, who are the important artists, so on and so forth. And I think that's where um, the state can play quite an important role uh, to build that kind of public education and public appreciation of who are our significant artists and I think that's where build the greatest support uh, for artists. It's not through the state buying individual paintings or individual artworks uh, but getting the, the broader society to, to acknowledge the importance of artists and then to support them by they, they themselves uh, buying and supporting artists. Thank you for the answers, and I'll do a quick summary in Thai before we leave for uh, the lunch break. ค่ะก็เดี๋ยวขออนุญาตสรุปนะคะเป็นเป็นเป็นแบบสั้นๆนะคะเกี่ยวกับคำตอบที่ทั้งสามท่านท่านได้ respond ต่อคำถามของคุณน้ำทองนะคะก็คือว่าท่านแรกคือศาสตราจารย์ไฮเนชได้ยกตัวอย่างนะคะว่าในกรณีของต้นเศษเนี่ยการให้การสนับสนุนนะคะของภาครัฐกับของภาคเอกชนเนี่ยค่อนข้างจะเ,เห็นได้ชัดนะคะว่ามีลักษณะที่แตกต่างกันแล้วก็เนื่องจากก็มีประวัติความเป็นมาที่ยาวนานนะคะก็บางครั้งก็ได้ทําให้มันเกิดข้อถกเถียงนะคะทั้งในเรื่องของนโยบายที่เกี่ยวข้องกับศิลปะวัฒนธรรมแล้วก็ในการสนับสนุนประเภทต่างๆของศิลปะที่มีธรรมชาติที่แตกต่างกันด้วยนะคะในส่วนของ
ศาสตราจารย์พอลเอสนะคะได้อ,อธิบายหรือว่ากล่าวถึงกรณีของฟิลิปปินส์นะคะว่าในปัจจุบันเนี่ยฟิลิปปินส์ก็มีหน่วยงานภาครัฐนะคะที่ทําหน้าที่ดูแลเรื่องสิทธิบัตรธรรมก็คือมีกระทรวงวัฒนธรรมนะคะในทำนองเดียวกันกับกระทรวงวัฒนธรรมที่เมืองไทยนะคะซึ่งได้ทําหน้าที่อย่างอื่นที่นอกเหนือไปจากการจัดซื้อแล้วก็จัดแสดงผลงานศิลปะนะคะก็คือกล่าวคือมีการทำคอลเลคชันของอาร์ชัยนะคะคือคือพวกข้อเขียนจดหมายเหตุข้อมูลหลักฐานต่างๆที่สามารถใช้ประโยชน์ต่อไปได้ในเชิงการศึกษานะคะหมายความว่าน้ำหนักถูกให้ไปกับการทำแหล่งข้อมูลหรือว่าแหล่งเรียนรู้นะคะซึ่งก็เป็นอีกมิติหนึ่งของอีกอยู่อีกรูปแบบหนึ่งของการให้การสนับสนุนนะคะซึ่งรวมไปถึงความเกี่ยวข้องกับเรื่องของประดกเชิงวัฒนธรรมและก็การท่องเที่ยวอีกด้วยนะะในส่วนของคุณโรซีบีนะคะที่กล่าวอธิบายถึงสิงคโปร์นะคะก็ได้ยกตัวอย่างว่าสิงคโปร์เนี่ยก็มีการสนับสนุนจากภาครัฐนะคะในส่วนของศิลปะเหมือนกันนะคะและถึงแม้ว่าเงินจะเรื่องสําคัญนะคะว่าเป็นดีว่าจะเป็นต้องมีงบประมาณที่จะซื้องานของศิลปินเพื่อที่จะสนับสนุนให้ศิลปินได้สามารถทํางานและมีชีวิตต่อไปได้เนี่ยนะคะแต่เอาเข้าจริงแล้วเนี่ยงบประมาณส่วนนี้ก็ต้องถือว่าไม่มากนะักนะค่อนข้างค่อนข้างจะเล็กเมื่อเทียบกับภาคส่วนอื่นๆนะคะแต่ว่าสำหรับเราชาวไทยเล็กๆของเขาคงเยอะมากเลยอย่างไรก็ตามนะคะนอกเหนือไปจากรูปแบบที่ว่ามานี้แล้วนะคะสิงคโปร์ก็ยังมีองค์กรที่หน่วยงานนะคะที่เรียกว่าอาร์ตคอนเซลนะคะหรือว่าสภาศิลปะที่สามารถให้ความช่วยเหลือหรือว่าสนับสนุนตัวศิลปินที่เป็นศิลปินท้องถิ่นนะคะในด้านต่างๆทั้งในเรื่องของการจัดแสดงผลงานการช่วยเหลือด้านงบประมาณนะคะแล้วอีกที่หนึ่งนอกเหนือมาจากอาร์ตคอนเซลก็คือหอศิลป์แห่งชาติสิงคโปร์นะคะหรือว่า National Gallery สิงคโปร์ซึ่งให้ความสําคัญกับการทําโครงการโปรแกรมที่เกี่ยวกับการศึกษานะคะหมายความว่าคนสิงคโปร์สามารถที่จะเรียนรู้เกี่ยวกับประวัติศาสตร์ศิลปะของสิงคโปร์ได้ด้วยการไปเยี่ยมชมงานนะคะที่หอศิลป์แห่งชาตินะคะซึ่งเขาก็มองว่าการให้การสนับสนุนทางด้านการศึกษานะคะต่อสาธารณะผ่านการจัดแสดงนิทรรศการในหอศิลป์แห่งชาติเนี่ยก็เป็นรูปแบบที่อีกรูปแบบหนึ่งของการให้การสนับสนุนที่จะนําไปสู่การสนับสนุนที่ยั่งยืนยิ่งขึ้นต่อไปเพราะว่ามันเกี่ยวข้องกับเรื่องของการสร้างองค์ความรู้และความเข้าใจเกี่ยวกับศิลปะให้ประชาชนทั่วไปรวมทั้งเจเนอเรชันต่อๆไปด้วยนะคะโอเคเดี๋ยวขออนุญาตรวบเป็นสำหรับช่วงเช้านะคะต้องขอบคุณวิทยากรทุกท่านนะคะรวมทั้งผู้ฟังทุกท่านที่อยู่ร่วมกันมาตั้งแต่สิโมนะคะเดี๋ยวจะขออนุญาตพักเปรตให้ไปรับประทานอาหารกลางวันนะคะจนถึงบ่ายสองนะคะก็ซัพพอร์ตโฮสต์ของเราคือ BCC นะคะด้วยการหาของกินในคาเฟ่หรือว่าในร้านอาหารต่างๆนะคะก่อนที่จะกลับมาที่ห้องนี้เหมือนเดิมตอนบ่ายสองซึ่งในช่วงบ่ายจะมีช่วง Q&A อีกอันหนึ่งที่ยาวกว่าในตอนท้ายนะคะสำหรับใครที่คิดว่าตอนบ่ายอาจจะไม่กลับมานะคะรบกวนคืนแบบสอบถามที่ตรงแล้วนะคะที่ตรงลงทะเบียนด้านหน้าอืมอืม